So in this video, we are going to talk about transformation. So the purpose of this experiment is to transform the ampicillin-sensitive E. coli, DH5-alpha, into an ampicillin-resistant strain with the uptake of a plasmid called PBR322. Now I know that's a lot of words that you might not be familiar with yet, but what you have to think about is ampicillin is a drug that's in the family of penicillins. And so remember that bacteria um, like E. coli, right, an antibiotic like ampicillin, would target the E. coli and cause it to die. And so the goal of this experiment is to transform ampicillin-sensitive E. coli, so again, E. coli that is normally sensitive to ampicillin, and to transform it into a resistant strain of E. coli. And we do so using a plasmid. And we'll talk in a minute about what a plasmid is. So what is transformation? Again, we've talked about this in lecture. Uh, transformation is where an organism takes up naked DNA from outside of its environment. And so in order for transformation to occur, several things have to happen. The first is that DNA has to be taken up through the cell wall and the cell membrane, meaning you have to get the DNA into the bacterial cell. And so what you're looking at um, up top here, this is a plasmid. And you're gonna see in a minute that a plasmid is a small extra chromosomal piece of DNA, meaning that it's a piece of DNA that replicates independently of the bacterial chromosome. And so what it has is it's going to have an origin of replication, which is gonna be where the plasmid will replicate. It has, in this case, an antibiotic resistance gene. And so again, in this experiment, we're looking for the ampicillin resistant gene. It has some sort of insert, which I'll talk more about in a minute. And so this is the piece of DNA that we're trying to get into the bacterial cell. And so we need, the first thing that has to happen is that the plasmid has to be trans, or the bacteria has to be transformed with this plasmid, meaning the plasmid has to get into the bacterial cell. Bacteria replicate. The DNA needs to be maintained or replicated within the cell, meaning that when the cell goes to divide, the plasmid also has to be replicating in the cell so that when the cells divide, the cells end up with plasmid as well. And what we're gonna see is that the plasmid actually replicates independently of the host chromosome, meaning it's not dependent on cell division. But we do in fact need it to be maintained. It needs to be replicated so that the offspring will pass on that plasmid. And the other key is that the organism must survive the process, right? Because if the process kills the organism, it's not gonna be a very successful process. And so we have our plasmid and an example of why you might want to do this. So the first um, human recombinant DNA drug to be produced was a drug called Humulin. And Humulin is for human insulin. And so for patients who have type 1 diabetes, for example, that is childhood diabetes. And so what happens in type 1 diabetes is that people have um, are born with an autoimmune disease, meaning that for those people who have type 1 diabetes, their immune system attacks their own pancreatic beta cells. And pancreatic beta cells are the cells in the body that are normally responsible for producing insulin. And so if you're born with this type 1 diabetes, your immune system starts attacking your own pancreatic beta cells. That's why it's called an autoimmune disease. So your immune system stops functioning properly, and instead of just attacking things that are foreign, it attacks your own pancreatic beta cells. When that happens and those cells get destroyed, those cells that normally produce insulin are no longer present, they're no longer functional. And so insulin in your body normally serves the purpose that when you eat food, right? And so as I eat breakfast in the morning, my body's going to do digestion. So the food's going to go into my stomach and then make its way to, to the intestines. 
and during the process of digestion, the food molecules get broken down. Those food molecules need to be broken down enough so that they can diffuse from my intestine into my bloodstream. Now, when that happens, as the food goes into my bloodstream, what happens as a result is that my blood sugar levels go up, right? My blood sugar goes up. And so normally what happens is when your blood sugar levels go up, your body's response is to produce insulin. And so the pancreatic beta cells will secrete insulin into the bloodstream. And insulin serves as the signal to all the cells in your body that, hey, sugar is available, glucose is present, the cells need to uptake glucose. So it puts the glucose transporter in the membrane of the cells and it gets the cells in your body to take up glucose. Because remember, your cells need glucose for metabolism to do respiration. So if somebody is type 1 diabetic, they do not have pancreatic beta cells. Their pancreatic beta cells have been destroyed by their own immune system which means that when they eat and their blood sugar goes up, when their blood sugar goes up, they no longer produce insulin. And so for them, their blood sugar levels stay high because there's no way for the cells to take up that glucose because without insulin, you don't put the glucose transporter in the membrane and therefore the glucose stays in the bloodstream and doesn't get into the cells. And so patients who have type 1 diabetes and who don't make functional insulin, they have to take an injection or an insulin pump or some form to deliver insulin when they eat because for them, they need the signal. They need to artificially get the signal to the cells to take up blood glucose. So historically, the way that insulin um, used to be produced for patients who are diabetic uh, typically through one of several ways. One would be to isolate it from cadavers. That can be a problem because it can be limiting. The other way that insulin used to be produced would be to get it from animal sources. So to use cattle or to use pigs or other animals that are used in slaughterhouses and use the insulin from the animals. Now the problem with that is it's not human insulin. And so sometimes patients would have reactions against this non-human insulin. And so obviously the best um, solution to this is to be able to give patients human insulin. Now to get it from patients, again, is gonna be a little bit tricky. So how then do we make human insulin? And the answer is that this was accomplished by recombinant DNA technology. And what that means is you can take a plasmid, so you can take this small extra chromosomal piece of DNA, and you can insert the human insulin gene. And so there's a series of steps that you can do. You can use restriction enzymes, which will cut the DNA. You can mix the, the insert, which in that case would be insulin, with the plasmid. You would ligate it, meaning you would put them together. And now your plasmid, would have your gene of interest, which is your insert. So in the case of insulin, right, so humulin, what they did was they cloned human insulin, put it in a plasmid, and then transformed bacteria to take up this plasmid. And so now this plasmid is in the bacteria. The genetic code is nearly universal. So when the bacteria sees that human insulin DNA sequence, it's going to produce human insulin protein. And so the bacteria grows very fast, right? E. coli can replicate every 20 minutes. It goes from one cell, it divides to two, two to four, four to eight, and so on and so forth. And so the E. coli can be grown in these very large bioreactors. They grow very quickly. And we can purify human insulin from the E. coli. And now we're able to get human insulin protein we're able to clone insulin and to manufacture insulin protein. And so this was the first recombinant DNA drug. It's called Humulin and it's for human insulin. And so again, we can take a human gene of interest, put it in a plasmid, transform it into bacteria, and then 
use the bacteria to make either a lot of that DNA sequence or, in the case of humulin, to produce the insulin protein. Now, a couple things that you need to realize when talking about a transformation. And the first is that when we go to transform bacteria, it happens at a very low frequency, meaning that not all the bacteria in your population is going to take up that DNA. And so because not all of it takes up DNA and it happens at a relatively low frequency, what that means is that we need a way to be able to identify which bacteria have our gene of interest, meaning which bacteria took up our plasmid. And so what you can do is that if this is your, amp or your antibiotic resistance gene, this could be what's called AMP-R, ampicillin resistance. You might recall, if you think back to penicillins, think about what some bacteria might produce that make bacteria resistant to penicillin. And you might recall that we talked about penicillinases or beta-lactamases. And those are proteins that are produced by resistant bacteria. And it allows the bacteria to cut the beta-lactam ring in penicillin. So if you're thinking about AMP-R, right, ampicillin is in the same family as penicillin. And so this is a gene that if the bacteria has it, it's going to allow it to make a protein like penicillinase that makes bacteria resistant to the antibiotic. And so the way that we can select for bacteria that have our gene of interest is that we would plate this on an LB ampicillin plate. LB stands for Luria broth. It's a very rich, nutrient-rich media that bacteria would use to grow. And AMP refers to the fact that on this plate is going to be the antibiotic ampicillin. And so what that means is that any colonies that grow on the plate have the plasmid. because the only way that they can grow in the presence of ampicillin is if they are resistant to ampicillin. How do they acquire the ability to be resistant? Well, they take up the plasmid. And so if the bacteria takes up this plasmid, it's gonna make it resistant so that if you take that bacteria and now plate it on a plate that is LB ampicillin, the only thing that can grow is going to be the uh, bacteria that have your uh, gene of interest, that have your plasmid. And so all these other places where we don't see growth, that could be places where there was bacteria present originally, but it didn't have its plasmid and therefore it could not grow. And so this, this having this ampicillin resistance, having this antibiotic resistance genes is helpful, it's needed so that we can select for bacteria that have our plasmid. Because again, it's going to happen at a low frequency. And so we need to have a way to select for bacteria that have our insert. So a little bit more about a plasmid. So plasmid, again, is a small circular DNA that is not part of an organism's chromosome. Again, it's extra chromosomal. And these can be used to propagate foreign DNA in organisms such as E. coli. Now, plasmids are not just limited to prokaryotic cells. Plasmids also occur in eukaryotic cells like yeast. Yeast can contain plasmids as well. If we look at the parts of a plasmid, there are several important parts to a plasmid. One part is what's called the origin, whoops, the origin of replication. The origin of replication is just like it suggests. It's where replication begins. Because remember that in order for um, 
transformation to be successful, the plasmid has to be replicated within the bacterial cell. And so we have to have this origin of replication as a site where replication begins so that the plasmid can be replicated. Um, we also need some sort of selectable marker. Again, this could be antibiotic resistance. So on our plasmid that we used for this lab, PBR322, it has two resistance genes. It has AMPR, so ampicillin resistance, and it has tetracycline resistant, TETR. And so this particular plasmid actually has two types of antibiotic uh, resistance genes that you could choose, for, choose between when plating your bacteria. So you need to have some sort of selectable marker so that you have a way to um, select for bacteria that contain your plasmid. And then the last part of the uh, plasmid would be something that's referred to as the multiple cloning site. And so if we look at this plasmid, you can see these like words here. This says Hindi 3, it's the name of a restriction enzyme. Eco R1, name of a restriction enzyme. These are, are um, DNA sequences, so on our plasmid, these are DNA sequences that can be recognized by restriction enzymes. And restriction enzymes, you might recall, are like molecular scissors. They're basically enzymes that bacteria produce, and they produce them as a defense mechanism. And so these restriction sites, these sites on the DNA, are recognized by specific restriction enzymes. And so if I wanted to clone my human insulin gene into this plasmid, the way that I would get the gene in is I would cut with a restriction site. I would cut with an enzyme like EcoR1, and I would cut both my plasmid and my insert with that restriction enzyme and then mix them together and that would allow it to fuse as one. Now I'm not going into all the procedures for that, but just know that this multiple cloning site is basically this collection of DNA sequence that has a variety of restriction sites in it. It has various places that we can cut the plasmid so that we can clone our gene of interest into that plasmid. So that's our multiple cloning site. Now those are helpful but they're not required. You don't have to have those on your plasmid, but they are helpful if you're trying to clone some gene and put it into a bacteria, like our human insulin gene. So our experiment for this is that we want, again, to have our E. coli take up our plasmid, to take up our PBR322. So in this experiment, we're using a strain of E. coli called DH5-alpha. And that DH5-alpha strain is a strain of E. coli that is more sensitive to transformation, meaning it's more likely for transformation to occur. But even in nature, the frequency of transformation is extremely low. So what we do first is we make bacteria what we call competent. So we make bacteria competent. And that means to make the bacteria more likely to take up the DNA. And you're gonna see in a minute that the way that we make bacteria competent is that we treat bacteria with ice cold calcium chloride. So think for a minute, if I have my bacterial cell. So here's my bacteria. Remember back to when we did our staining, right? And so if you remember back to when we talked about our staining, what charge do our bacterial cells have? What charge do our cells have? Think about the cell membrane. What is in the cell membrane? 
that makes the cell charged? And the answer is, is that the cell has a phospholipid bilayer. Those phosphate groups, remember, have a negative charge. So we have our bacteria and we have our negative charge. Now, if you think about it, we also have our plasmid. And our plasmid is our circular DNA. Now, if you think about DNA, remember that the building blocks of DNA are referred to as nucleotides. Nucleotides have three parts, sugar, phosphate, nitrogenous base. What does that tell you about the charge? Notice there's a phosphate on DNA. What charge is the DNA gonna contain? And the answer is the DNA is also negatively charged. Right? And so if my DNA is negative and my bacterial cell is negative, do those want to go together? Is it likely that that's going to happen very often? The answer is no. Like charges repel. They don't want to be together. So the way that we make bacteria what we call competent is that we treat it with calcium chloride. So what does calcium chloride do? Well, calcium chloride is going to dissociate into calcium ions and chloride ions. It's gonna break apart. So when I put calcium chloride in the solution, the calcium and the chloride ions are gonna separate. So notice that when I have those calcium ions, and these calcium ions are positively charged, what's gonna happen is, is those positively charged calciums are going to neutralize the charge on the bacteria. The calcium is also going to neutralize the charge on the plasmid. So now, if I neutralize those charges, is it more likely that the bacteria is gonna be able to take up the plasmid? And the answer is yes, because now we don't have those like charges repelling. We've neutralized those charges. And so it's gonna make it much more likely that the bacteria is gonna take up our plasmid. And so we call that making bacteria competent. They're competent, they're ready, and they're able to take up the plasmid. And so we make bacteria competent by incubating with cold calcium chloride. Now, this is not the only way that bacteria can be made um, competent. There are other ways as well. There are other ways to get transformation to occur, but it is one of the more common ways that scientists um, will make bacteria competent because it's relatively easy to do. It doesn't require special equipment. It's a very easy procedure to accomplish. And so in our experiment, we would have to start by making bacteria competent for transformation by incubating in ice cold calcium chloride. Now the calcium chloride again is going to neutralize the charges, but we still need the plasmid to get into the bacterial cell. And so what's gonna happen is, is after we make bacteria competent, we're gonna do a step that's called a heat shock. And what that means is we're going to take this bacteria that's mixed with our plasmid, and for a very short time, about 90 seconds, we're gonna take that tube that has both together and we're gonna put it in a water bath that is set at 42 degrees Celsius. So notice that that temperature is above human body temperature. So we're warming it up. What happens to molecular motion when you heat something up? Answer is molecular motion increases, right? And so if you think about the molecules of the cell membrane, if we heat them up, those molecules are gonna move faster, right? And as those molecules move faster, you're gonna get these pores, these openings, where the plasmid can go in. So this is when the plasmid goes into the bacteria.
Now, do we want to do that step at 42 degrees for a long period of time? Answer is no, right? That would denature proteins and would kill the bacteria. This is temporary. We do this for a very short period of time, just enough to create these pores for the plasmid to get in. So we do our heat shock step, the plasmid gets into the bacteria, and then we're gonna take that bacteria and we're gonna spread it on a plate that contains LB with ampicillin. And so again, it has our selective growth media because we want the only thing to grow on the plate to be the bacteria that have our plasmid. Any bacteria that doesn't have our plasmid should die if plated with ampicillin, right? So if I draw a population of bacteria, and let's say, so we'll put our plasmid. So this one took up our plasmid, this one took up our plasmid. Sorry, the pen's being weird. So those two took up our plasmid. And again, what that means is that those two bacteria have the ampicillin resistance. So if I take this population of bacteria, some of it have the plasmid and others don't, anything that did not take up the plasmid, when I plate it on ampicillin, this is gonna die, this is gonna die. Anything that doesn't have our plasmid is going to be killed by the ampicillin. And so what we end up with is we end up with a plate, and on our plate we have colonies. And these represent, this will be a colony. This will be a colony. Because when we spread them on the plate, each of these dots represents originally one bacterial cell that was transformed. That cell divided asexually, right? It, it went from one cell divided to two, two cells to four, four cells to eight, until we get above about a million where we start to then see a visible colony. And so this is kind of an overview of how our transformation experiment works, right? So we start by making our bacteria competent, meaning more likely to take up the plasmid. We do that by treating with calcium chloride. Calcium ions neutralize the negative charges so that we don't have repelling between bacteria and plasmid. So we neutralize the charges, we make the bacteria competent, then we take that bacteria and we heat shock it, put it at 42 degrees for a short period of time, increases molecular motion, causes adhesion zones, which allows the plasmid to go in. We do give bacteria time to recover after that process, which you'll see in a minute, but ultimately the goal is we're gonna take that population that we heat shocked, and again, you're gonna have some bacteria that have our gene of interest, that have our plasmid, others that don't. So if I take that bacteria and I plate it on a plate with LB with ampicillin, the only thing that grows on the plate is going to be the bacteria that took up the plasmid. So we can assume that anything that grew on our plate took up our plasmid. So I have some animations that I wanna show you to just kind of review and talk about how this works. So here is an animation that comes from Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory. And so what you're seeing is the purple, these are um, E. coli, and we have our plasmids. Now there's a variety of different plasmids in this mixture. Some have just a green insert, some have a blue, some have both. The purpose of this, we don't need to worry about right now, but let's look at what happens. So basically we need the plasmid to get into the E. coli. So when we mix them together and the um, 
and the bacteria is made competent by the calcium chloride. Again, the calcium chloride is going to neutralize the charges. And so then when we heat shock, that's gonna cause, we heat shock and then it, the temperature goes back down and that's gonna cause the bacteria to take up your plasmid. And so once we get the bacteria to take up the plasmid, then we will plate it on a plate that contains the antibiotic. So put it on a plate that has our antibiotic. In this case, they're, te they're testing tetracycline and canamycin. And so notice that any bacteria that had those antibiotic resistance genes were able to grow and replicate, um, and those would be the colonies that you would appear on the plate. And so you would see those colonies. And again, that means that they took up both of those antibiotic resistant genes. And so we don't need to talk about this other part, but let me show you another video. So this is basically showing how transformation works. So again, we have our E. coli. Here is our cell membrane. And again, the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Those phosphate groups, remember, have a, negatively char have a negative charge. There we go. Here's our DNA. Our DNA is also negatively charged because of the phosphate groups on the DNA. So we need to treat with ice cold calcium chloride. And again, the calcium chloride is going to make bacteria competent. It's going to neutralize the charges. Okay, so we neutralize the charges and the temperature is cold when doing this. And so the molecular motion is slow. The calcium chloride, the calcium ions are going to interact with the phospholipid bilayer. They're also going to interact with um, the DNA. And so by cooling it down, that's why I said cold calcium chloride, it's going to stabilize the interaction between the calcium and the charges on the DNA as well as the cell membrane. Now we do our heat shock. We raise it to 42 degrees. And so that is going to cause these pores, these adhesion zones to open and the DNA is going to get into the E. coli. And so I have one more video to show you. The goal of transformation is to cause bacteria, in this case E. coli, to pick up DNA plasmids from their environment. The bacteria are negatively charged because of the structure of their lipid bilayer cell membrane. And the plasmids are negatively charged as well because of their DNA's phosphate backbone. Since they are both negatively charged, they tend to repel one another. To facilitate this interaction, calcium chloride is mixed in with the bacterial cells. Once in solution, the positively charged calcium ions bind to the negatively charged phosphate groups on the cell surface and neutralize their charge. Plasmids containing the gene of interest, RFP, are then mixed with the treated cells at 4 degrees Celsius. The temperature is quickly increased to 42 degrees Celsius and then reduced back to 4 degrees Celsius. This heat shock results in the formation of adhesion zones, creating a leaky plasma membrane. This may enable the cell to take up a plasmid from the solution. After heat shock, the bacterial cells are placed at 37 degrees Celsius and allowed to recover before being plated. Bacterial samples are now put on agar plates to test for successful transformations. The plate on the left contains the antibiotic ampicillin alone, and the plate on the right contains ampicillin and the sugar arabinose. On the left is a negative control plate, P-, where the transformation reaction was done without any plasmid. In the middle is another negative control, where transformation was carried out with plasmids but where the gene of interest will not be expressed since the growth medium lacks the arabinose inducer.
On the right is the permissive growth condition with the Rabinos that will let us identify successful transformations. After a 24-hour incubation period, any cell that was transformed with plasmid survives and divides to form a colony in the presence of the antibiotic ampicillin. However, only cells that were transformed with plasmid and grown in the presence of ampicillin and arabinos will result in red colonies. We expect these red colonies to have synthesized the mutant fluorescent protein MFP. And so what you saw in that video, that is an animation um, where what they were doing in that experiment is they took RFP, which stands for red fluorescent protein. It's a uh, protein that when produced allows bacteria to glow red under certain wavelength lights. We also have um, green fluorescent protein, GFP, which glows green, that's derived from jellyfish. But the idea is that what they did in this experiment was they took bacteria and they took a plasmid and they cloned the RFP gene in it. So they took that RFP, that red fluorescent protein gene, and they put it in a plasmid. On that plasmid is the ampicillin resistance gene. This setup is a little bit different too in that it had one additional step, and that is that the red fluorescent protein is only expressed, meaning the bacteria will only make that um, protein, they'll only transcribe and then translate it, when arabinose, which is a sugar, is present. And so what you saw is that in the plate that did not have plasmid, right? If there was no plasmid added and you take the bacteria and you grow it on LB ampicillin, the bacteria is not going to grow because the ampicillin on the plate is gonna kill all the bacteria because none of them have ampicillin resistance. The one in the middle that they showed was LB with ampicillin, and it was bacteria that had the plasmid, but it did not have arabinose sugar on the plate. And so what happened is, is that some of the bacteria was transformed. It was able to take up the plasmid. The plasmid got in, and when it grew on the plate, it grew because it had the antibiotic resistance, but it didn't produce the RFP, the red fluorescent protein. None of those colonies were red because they need the arabinose to turn on production of the RFP. And so in the last plate that was on the far right, we had LB, ampicillin, and arabinose, the sugar. The sugar is the inducer. So only bacteria that were transformed grew. And now because arabinose was on the plate, now those colonies were able to produce that mutant red fluorescent protein. And so those colonies would glow in the dark. And so that was what you were seeing there. So let me walk you through the experiment and how we would have done this experiment. So what you would do is you would take three tubes. Now these are microfuge tubes. Um, this can be done in small glass tubes. Um, like think of the tubes that we typically use when we're doing a streak plate, for example. Um, so any small tubes would work. But what we would do in this experiment is that we have three tubes that we're working with. So we would number our tubes, tube one, tube two, and tube three. Tube one and tube two, we would add 0.25 milliliters of calcium chloride. Remember that when we convert that to microliters, and we would do this with a micropipette, this would be 250 microliters. So we would do this with a P1000 micropipetter and we would pipette 250 microliters of calcium chloride into tube one and into tube two. We are not putting it in tube three 
Tube three is a control, and this control has no calcium chloride. And I'll talk about what the controls are for a minute, in a minute. So in tube three, we're not adding calcium chloride at all. So in that tube, we're adding 250 microliters of Luria broth, which is basically just growth media. Then once we add either the calcium chloride or the LB, we would add a large inoculum of E. coli DH5-alpha. So this would be E. coli that we grow on a plate. You would use your loop and your aseptic technique and you would pick up a big glob of the E. coli and you would add it to the calcium chloride. Now, it's really important when you have your calcium chloride, the calcium chloride has to be kept cold with the bacteria. So when we do this experiment, the calcium chloride has been either in the refrigerator or on ice. During this experiment, except for the heat shock step, the beginning part of this experiment has to be done under cold conditions. If the tube warms up, it might kill your bacteria and you need your bacteria to survive in order for transformation to be successful. So the calcium chloride is cold. We add our DH5 alpha to the tube and we keep it on ice. So you can see this picture of an ice bucket. You would have a bucket of ice at your desk. You would keep these tubes on ice, add your DH5 alpha using your aseptic technique to each of these tubes. So all three tubes end up with bacteria in them. Now, the next thing you're gonna do is you're going to add your plasmin. And so we would add 10 microliters of our plasmid, which is our uh, PBR322. We are going to add this to tube one and to tube three, but we're not adding it to tube two. Tube two is our no plasmid control. So our no plasmid control, because we wanna see is the plasmid needed for transformation. So tube three is our no calcium chloride. Tube two is our no plasmid control. So notice that we have one variable in each. Tube three is missing the calcium chloride. Tube two is missing the plasmid. Tube three has the plasmid, but it doesn't have the calcium chloride. Tube one has everything. So we would add our plasmid you would vortex for five seconds, so to mix um, the plasmid with the bacteria, and then we would leave it on ice for 15 minutes. And again, the purpose of this step is to make bacteria competent. We're giving time for the calcium ions to neutralize the charge on the DNA and to neutralize the charge on the E. coli because we have E. coli in that tube as well. So we leave our tubes on ice for 15 minutes. This is when bacteria is gonna become competent. It's gonna become able to take up our plasmid. Then we take our tubes and we would have a 42 degree water bath and we would take our tubes and we would stick them in the 42 degree water bath for 90 seconds. Again, that's our heat shock step. So we increase molecular motion, we get these adhesion zones, this part where the membrane sticks together and we get these pores. Now the plasmid can get into the cell. After we do our heat shock step, we put our tubes on ice for 30 seconds, give them a little bit of time to recover because again, you don't want them to be warm for too long. So we put them on ice for 30 seconds. After we put them on ice for 30 seconds, we're gonna add 0.25 milliliters, again that's 250 microliters of Luria broth. So again, the Luria broth is a rich, nutrient-rich media. And so this is where you're gonna give bacteria nutrients 
You're going to dilute the calcium chloride so that it's not at such a high concentration. And you're basically going to give the bacteria time to recover after that heat shock step. So to each tube, we add 250 microliters of Luria broth. We would swirl gently to mix. And then we incubate at room temperature for 10 minutes. We don't need to keep it on ice anymore because the LB is diluting out the calcium chloride. So it's fine, we leave them at room temperature for 10 minutes. And again, we're trying to give bacteria time to recover before we plate them. And so after the 10 minutes at room temperature, then we would plate them on the corresponding plates. So what we would have in this experiment is you would have three plates that are LB plus ampicillin. They have the antibiotic on the, on the plate. You have one plate that would be LB only. It does not have any ampicillin, it just has LB. So what you end up with is control number one has no ampicillin. It has no antibiotic on the plate. And in a minute, you're gonna think about how that affects whether we should see growth or not. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Control number two, so I'm gonna skip this one. Control number two, remember was from tube two, which we did not add the plasmid. So that's our no plasmid control. Tube three, remember, was the one that was not treated with calcium chloride. We added LB in the beginning and no calcium chloride. So control three is our no calcium chloride control. And then we have one plate, which is our experimental plate, and that's our transformation plate, where we gave the bacteria everything. We have bacteria in that tube, we have calcium chloride to make them competent, we gave them the plasmid, and we're gonna plate it on a plate with LB and ampicillin. So that would be your transformation plate. And so you would label all of your four plates, so according to this, so control one, you would write no amp on the LB only plate. Um, on one LB amp plate, you would write transformation plate. On another LB amp plate, you would label it no plasmid control. On the last LB amp plate, you would write no calcium chloride control. So just like before, you would always um, write on the auger side of the plate. You would label what would be on the plate. You would put you and your partner's um, initials or your group mate's initials on your plate. You would put the date on your plate. And then you would add the sample. So for tube number one, you're gonna add it onto two plates, onto control one and to the transformation. And 0.2 milliliters, so that would be 200 microliters. So we would add 200 microliters of the contents of tube one onto each of those two plates. To your control two, you would add 200 microliters of tube two, to control three, you would add 200 microliters of tube three. And so in the next slide, I'm gonna show you a video that shows you how to do your plating um, when you're taking this bacteria and you're adding it to a plate that already has, um, that already has the auger on it. So how to make sure that the bacteria gets evenly spread across your plate. And so let me show you the video to show you how we would spread this. In this demonstration, I'm gonna show how to uh, spread your bacteria culture evenly on your LB plates. In order to do this, the first thing you're gonna to want to do is take your measured quantity of E. coli that you have resuspended in LB, and then just use a micropipetter to um, apply it to your plates. Close it up, and this will keep it sterile until we're going to use it next. Your pipette tip should just be ejected into your pipette tip waste. Okay, now in order to spread this evenly, you have to uh, use a spreader, and the spreader needs to be sterile before it goes on the plate. Um, this spreader right now is soaking in ethanol, and ethanol is flammable. And so what I'll be doing is taking out the spreader and basically 
catching it on fire. This further sterilizes the spreader, but it is actually warm. So in order to cool it down a little bit before it touches your cells, I'm going to open the plate and just gently touch to the auger to cool it down a little bit. Once it's cool, I'm going to very gently spread the bacterial culture around the plate. I'm not pressing down. If I press down, I'll dig into the plate and uh, that'll cause divots or I might break the actual spreader which is only made of glass. Once it's been spread evenly, then you are going to want to distribute it even more. And the way you do this is to uh, tilt the plate, take your spreader at a 90 degree angle to the plate, start at the bottom, and very gently swipe it back and forth from the top to the bottom of the plate. Again, do not apply pressure because this can dig into your plate. And also, when you're doing this, try not to talk um, because bacteria from your mouth might land on your plate. Um, I'm talking now, of course, because this is a demonstration. Once you've done it in one direction, turn your plate a quarter turn and start at the top again. And then, starting from the top, swipe down, again using the edge, in the other direction. Once this is done, close your plate, put the spreader back into the ethanol. Now these plates, when they're all ready, um, should be uh, uh, stored with the auger side up, the cap down and the auger side up. You can stack these plates and uh, place them into the incubator that way. When they go in the incubator, the E. coli will begin to multiply and eventually each individual E. coli that's landed on the plate will form a mound, if it can survive, it'll form a mound of clone cells which we call a colony. Now when you, before you go to your next plate, remember that you're going to repeat the same thing again. You're going to take your plate and put your cells on it. Again, you need to take the spreader out, you need to sterilize it by fire, cool it down on the plate, and then spread your next plate accordingly. And so a couple things about that, and you want to think about when you do this. If I were to take that spreader and I were to flame it, would I ever want to put that, that um, spreader that's hot into my glass of ethanol? And the answer is no. You can catch that beaker of ethanol on fire. So never, ever, ever put a hot spreader back into the beaker of ethanol. When you're doing your spreading, remember that your sterile field, the area that you want to be working, is close to your flame, right? Because close to your flame is going to be the most sterile part of your desk. So when you do this, you would do this out in front of you, meaning the plates are not right underneath you. You would do this next to your, next to your Bunsen burner, right? Because that's your sterile field. And so you just want to keep that in mind when you're thinking about aseptic technique and when you're doing this experiment and how you would spread it. So a couple things that would be important if you were doing this experiment. Um, one would be keep your bacteria cold at all times, right? You cannot let that bacteria warm up until after you've diluted it with the LB, the Luria broth. And so heating the cells um, with the calcium chloride will cause them to die. And so you have to make sure to keep your bacteria on ice and cold at all times. Expose the bacteria to the air for as short a period as possible. Only open the tubes as necessary, and this is used to prevent contamination. Now, if we were doing this with our, you know, our glass tubes or even plastic tubes, if I have cold glass tubes, right, they're sitting on ice, am I going to be flaming the opening of those tubes? Answer is no. So you would have to keep in mind that we're not using our typical aseptic technique. And oftentimes in molecular biology, the aseptic technique is a little bit looser because you're working with antibiotics. Right? And the only thing that's going to grow are bacteria that take up your plasmid. 
So there's less likely that contamination can occur, but it can occur. And we want to minimize this by keeping those tubes closed as often as we can, right? We only wanna open them when we need to and then recap them right away. And so now we're going to talk about what we would do on our second day, right? So once we spread all four plates, we would take our four plates, we would turn them auger side up, and we would put them in the incubator. And then we would come back during the next class period and we would analyze our results. We would look at what plates we see growth on. And so what we're gonna do before I show you the actual results is that we are going to predict what we expect to see happen. And so we'll start with the predictions first. So again, just I would um, remind you of our experiment on the second day. And so I'll go ahead and do it again. And so again, the purpose of our transformation is to transform the ampicillin sensitive E. coli, DH5-alpha, into an ampicillin resistant strain with the uptake of our plasmid PBR322. So again, here's our plasmid. It has its amp resistance. So we start with our E. coli, and our E. coli is typically ampicillin sensitive, meaning ampicillin will inhibit E. coli from growing. We would mix the bacteria with the plasmid. We would make the bacteria competent by treating it with calcium chloride. The calcium is going to neutralize the charge on the cell, as well as the DNA, the plasmid. We would then do our heat shock, which would allow the plasmid to get into the bacteria. So our plasmid would go in. So step three, notice now we have our bacteria and it has our plasmid. And then we would plate it on our plate that contains the ampicillin. And so the only thing that should grow on a plate with ampicillin are colonies that are ampicillin resistant, meaning they took up our plasmid. So let's discuss what we expect in our experiment. So in our experiment, we had four plates. We had one plate, which we called our transformation plate. That plate was plated on LB with ampicillin. It had E. coli in it. It was treated with calcium chloride and it had the plasmid. We had control number one. Control number one was our E. coli. It was treated with the calcium chloride and it had our plasmid. Remember that the same sample, tube number one, was put on two plates. One was LB with ampicillin and the other one is an LB only plate. So control number one is our no ampicillin plate. That's our no ampicillin control. Tube two. Tube number two was E. coli mixed with calcium chloride, but we did not add plasmid to that tube. So this is our no plasmid control. Right, it has LB and ampicillin, but the one thing it's missing is the plasmid. So when you're looking at experiments, for each sample, you should only have one variable, only one thing that changes. So control number one, the one variable is no ampicillin. It's plated on an LB only plate. Control number two has everything else, but no plasmid. Control number three, is your no calcium chloride control. So we had E. coli and we mixed it with the Luria broth at the beginning, so not the calcium chloride. We added the plasmid. We plated it on an LB ampicillin plate. But again, our bacteria was not, um, was not treated with the calcium chloride. So let me move this up here for you. So what I want you to do is, and in a minute you can pause this to think about your answer before you hear my explanation, but what I want you to do is for each of these plates, I want you to predict 
if growth should be present. So do you expect bacteria to grow on that plate? If there is growth, how much growth do you expect? A lot of bacteria, like the whole plate is covered, um, some bacterial growth, no growth. How much growth do you expect? So think about it. What is in each tube and how does that help with the transformation process? And if you're missing that ingredient, do you expect transformation to occur? And so I want you to take a minute and pause the video. And again, it's always helpful for you to think through it first before you hear the answer. So please take the time, pause it, try and work through this on your own first, and then when you're ready, push play so that I can go over the answer with you. So go ahead, push pause. Okay, so let's go over the answers. So transformation plate. We have E. coli, we have calcium chloride, we have plasmid, and we plate it on a plate that is LB with ampicillin. So our E. coli was made competent with the calcium chloride, right? So it makes the, it makes the bacteria competent. It has plasmid. So the plasmid, when the E. coli is competent, the plasmid should be able to get into the E. coli and you should end up with E. coli that have your plasmid. You plate it on a plate that is LB with ampicillin. So if I take that sample and I put it on a plate that is LB plus ampicillin, would I expect to get growth? And the answer is yes, I would expect to see growth because by treating the bacteria with calcium chloride, I made them competent. By giving them plasmid, I gave them the antibiotic resistance gene. So when I put it on a plate that has ampicillin, that bacteria should grow. But will all the bacteria in that sample grow? And the answer is no, because bacteria that did not take up our plasmid is not gonna grow. And remember that I said that this happens at a low frequency. So it's not like you're gonna end up with a plate that is completely covered in bacteria because not all of the bacteria is gonna grow. Only transformed bacteria is gonna grow. And so what I would expect is, oh, I did the next one. So we'll come back to the transformation. I'll go through the controls first. So control number one. Control number one, same tube as number one. So we have E. coli, we made it competent with the calcium chloride, we had um, the plasmid, but we plated it on a plate that does not have ampicillin. So we made bacteria competent, we gave it the plasmid to make it resistant, but we're plating it on a plate that does not have ampicillin. In that case, in our LB only plate, is any bacteria inhibited? Answer is no. Not, none of the bacteria is gonna be inhibited. Transformed bacteria is gonna grow. Non-transformed bacteria is gonna grow. Everything's gonna grow in this case. And so what we would expect for control number one is what we call a lawn. A lawn means that the whole plate is covered in growth. So lots of growth, again, a lawn, all bacteria will grow, not just transformed because there's nothing inhibiting the non-transformed bacteria from growing. So we would expect that control number one is going to be covered in growth. Now let's talk about control number two. Control number two is our no plasmid control. So we have our E. coli, we made the E. coli competent with the calcium chloride, but we don't give them the plasmid, which means they don't get the ampicillin resistant gene. So they're competent, but they don't have the gene to be ampicillin resistant. We plate it on a plate that is LB with ampicillin. 
do we expect to see growth? And the answer is no. We don't expect to see growth because the bacteria is not going to have the antibiotic resistance gene. We did not give them the plasmid, and therefore they are not antibiotic resistant. Control number three. We have E. coli, but we did not treat with calcium chloride. So we did not make bacteria competent. We gave them the plasmid and we plated them on LB with ampicillin. Do we expect growth? Answer, no, or very little, because we need the calcium chloride to make the bacteria competent to take up the plasma. Because again, if not, the frequency at which that happens is extremely low because the cell is negatively charged, the DNA is negatively charged, they're going to repel. So we would expect not to see growth on control number three. But again, on our transformation plate, which I was starting to explain before, we would expect to see some growth, right? We're not gonna get a lawn like control number one because in our transformation plate, only transformed bacteria will grow. Only the bacteria that took up our plasmid would be able to grow on this plate. And so that's what we would expect. Now, these are our expectations. Think about in real life, do our experiments always work out the way that we expect? Answer is no. So the next thing I want you to think about before I talk about it with you is I want you to see if you can brainstorm some ideas of why you might not get the result you expect. Like for number two, control two, we expect no growth. Could you imagine a scenario where you might get growth? Or for number three, control three, could you imagine a scenario where you might get, um, you might get some growth? For number control one in our transformation plate, can you think of a scenario why you might get no growth? And so again, I want you to pause the video, think about if you can brainstorm why you might not get the result that you would expect because it doesn't always work the way you expect it to. So pause it and when ready, push play. Okay, so let's go over these together. Our transformation plate. We expect to get some growth, right? We expect to see some growth. So we expect to see colonies, but we don't expect to see a lawn. Let's talk about why we might get some deviations from what we expect. Let's say we get no growth on our plate. So we get our transformation plate and we get no growth. So what are some reasons why we might not get growth. One, it's possible, remember, that you had to keep the E. coli and the calcium chloride, that solution, cold. You had to keep it on ice at all times. It's possible that you didn't keep it cold. And by warming it up, it caused the E. coli to die. That's one possibility. Another one, think of the spreader. If I use the spreader while it's still hot and I touch the bacteria, what's gonna to happen to the bacteria on the plate? It's gonna die, right? So you could get no growth because of problems with your experiment. So either your spreader was too hot when you used it, you warmed up your sample, maybe you forgot to add one of the ingredients. It's possible that you accidentally did not add the calcium chloride or you did not add the plasmid to that tube. That is completely possible too, right? You might not have added everything you thought you did. Now, those are why you would get no growth. Think about why you might get a lot of growth, meaning so much bacteria that it's not, not isolated colonies. Well, in your plate, we have LB with ampicillin. So when we make these plates, we actually pour these plates. Um, the broth is mixed with the antibiotic before we pour our plates. Couple problems could go wrong. One, 
we autoclave the LB and then we add the drug and then we pour it. If that LB is still too hot from the autoclave, if the temperature is too high, it might break down the ampicillin. Or in some cases, we actually pour a bunch of these plates at once and then we'll often stack them and keep them in the refrigerator until we need them. Now, who knows, what if we don't use those plates for a long period of time? What if those plates are really old? Well, if those plates are really old, the ampicillin might break down and therefore it's not inhibiting microbial growth and you end up with a lawn. And so that could be a reason why you might see a lawn. Control number one, no ampicillin. Again, we expect to see a lot of growth. If we don't see growth, could be a variety of reasons, very much the same way that the transformation plate. Maybe we heated up the tube with the calcium chloride and the E. coli. Maybe our spreader was too hot, right? These are all reasons that you might see nothing on that plate. Control number two. Control number two has no plasmid, right? And so we expect to see no growth because the plasmid contains the antibiotic resistance gene. Now, do bacteria in nature randomly, spontaneously become resistant to antibiotics? Answer is yes, happens all the time. So if you see a colony or two, right, if you see one or two colonies, it could be that you saw spontaneous mutation meaning that the bacteria naturally acquired resistance to ampicillin. That's possible. So if you see a little bit of growth, it could be that the bacteria spontaneously became resistant. If you see a lot of growth, if your plate looks similar to your transformation plate, that's not likely spontaneous mutation because what are the chances that that many unique bacteria all became resistant? If you saw a lot of growth, there's a couple other explanations. One, the ampicillin is no longer effective. Again, it's old, et cetera. So the ampicillin is not working properly. So that's one possibility. Um, if you see a lot of growth, maybe you got cross-contamination. Maybe you forgot to change your pipette between your tubes and you accidentally added some plasmid inadvertently to control number two because you were using your same tip from tube number one. Possible, right? That's why you might see some growth. Control number three is our no calcium chloride. Again, we expect to see no growth or in some very rare cases, a little bit, right? And that's because in nature is calcium chloride absolutely necessary for transformation? The answer is no. Bacteria do that spontaneously as well. So by having plasmid and E. coli, it is very possible that bacteria took up the plasmid on its own without the calcium chloride and was resistant. But again, it's going to happen at a very rare frequency. You might see one colony, maybe two. But if you see a lot of growth, again, that's not to be expected. The ampicillin was old, you cross-contaminated your sample, etc. So now, now that we've talked about these controls and what we expect, why do we even do the control? Because we need to make sure that our experiment is working the way that we expect. And that is that our transformation, if we just did our transformation plate and we saw colonies, we don't know why those colonies are there. Could it be because the ampicillin was old? Why did we see colonies? If we did the control plates and we saw no growth with um, no plasmid and no growth with the calcium chloride, then our transformation results are more meaningful because our experiment is working the way that we expect. The ampicillin is inhibiting microbial growth that is not antibiotic resistant. And so on our transformation plate, anything we see, we can say with some confidence that that bacteria has our plasmid because we know our experiment's working properly.
And so this would be why we do these controls. You might wonder, well, why do we do all these extra plates? To make sure that our experiment works the way that we expect. So that when we compare to our experimental plate, which is our transformation plate, that the results have meaning. That we know that our experiment is working properly the way that we would expect. And so we're going to look at what do those plates actually look like. So these are our plates from when students have done transformation. And what you're looking at is um, this top left plate is the transformation plate. And you can see isolated individual colonies. Each of those colonies represented one initial, um, initial bacteria that was transformed, meaning that bacteria took up the plasmid. That bacteria divided from one cell to two, two cells to four, four cells to eight, so on and so forth, until it became a visible mass, which we can see as a colony. So our transformation plate um, is going to have these colonies. So we have some growth, but it's not a lawn. Look at our plate, our control plate, which was control number one. That was no ampicillin. See how you can see, you can actually kind of see like right here, this little line there, this is milky bacteria just covering the plate. We call that a lawn. There's so much bacteria there that you're not seeing individual colonies. And that's because without ampicillin, all bacteria are growing, transformed and non-transformed. Everything grew. In our transformation plate, that's not the case. Notice that the those came from the same tube, those were both from tube number one, yet they have a different result, which tells us that the uh, colonies on our transformation plate are in fact transformed colonies. Our ampicillin is doing its job, it's inhibiting bacteria that is not transformed. Because on our no ampicillin plate, we have just this mound of bacteria, it's just this big lawn, the whole plate is covered in bacteria. If I look at my control plate, that is control number two, which is no plasmid, I don't see any growth. Same thing on my control plate with no calcium chloride, no growth. Because again, plasmid is going to contain the antibiotic resistance gene. The calcium chloride is what makes the bacteria competent. So without those ingredients, we don't expect to see transformation occurring. And so this is your transformation experiment. This is how you would do it, and these would be the results. So when you're studying this, you want to know for each of these plates, do you expect to see growth? Why or why not? What might be some reasons if you get a result that is different than what you expect? And then you should have an understanding of what is the purpose of the ampicillin. What is the purpose of the calcium chloride? What is the purpose of the plasmid? And so you want to have a general understanding of how this experiment works.